Hello and welcome to our third part of our Unafraid series by Anna Hamilton. Where we're going to be talking uh, about specifically the failure, disappointment, disappointing others, insignificance, and loneliness, the fear of those things. But before we get started, I just make sure you know that we're on the part three of this. So if you haven't a book, make sure you get one. Read the book. It's, it follows some of my teaching, but I, I follow along with it. I do my own stories with it. So that's happening right now. So without further ado, let's take a moment and pray as we begin. Lord God, we give you thanks for this time. We ask that you be with us. Help us to open up to your spirit to know that we are loved and that you are with us. And as we look at the fears that we have internally, help us to know that you will never leave us. And you give us truth and love and patience and caring, and you walk with us each and every hour of our day. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Okay, so let's get started here. This is a, talking about the first chapter in chapter nine in this part three. is talking about the fear of failure, the fear of failure. And you know what? I remember very well for myself, I had just been living in Australia, which was pretty risky as it was, but um, moving back, I got the opportunity Got a call from a good friend um, from Laity Lodge from the H.E. Butt Foundation that they wanted somebody to open up a camp for families, and they would like me to consider doing that. And I ended up saying yes, and it was a risk. I mean, it was a big risk. It was the only guarantee to be a two-year deal to start off with. I mean, they, they, they wanted to move and they wanted to build this place, but they weren't sure, and they wanted to do a two-year trial, and would I even consider it? Well, I did, and I remember about a year and a half, almost two years into it, coming back home one day for Holly and the kids, and I was going, I don't think this is going to work. This is this is going to total failure. I don't think we're going to be raised the money to be able to do this. I don't think we're going to get, we got that initial gift and a few others, but I'm not sure if we're going to be able to raise the money to build this place, and I don't know, honey, maybe we did the wrong thing in coming here. And I remember that fear that came over me that maybe it's not possible. And we prayed about it, and then we kept walking through it. And right after that, and got opportunities for people to give, and, and the camps be really filling up. And, and we ended up raising the money and building this brand new place because we didn't let the fear of failure overtake us. We walked through instead. So what is that principles of risk then? So I wanna, he gives a couple of different things I think are really helpful to us when we're talking about the fear of failure. Um, he says, most things are never as hard as you think that they'll be. So right at the very beginning, I thought it was gonna be really hard. At first, it just wasn't. It's not as hard as I, in your mind that you maybe think. The second one, he says, successful people are willing to do things that unsuccessful people are unwilling to do. So just... Okay, this is what I'm called to do. I'm willing to risk and do that to be successful. Now, when it comes to a fork in the road, we all have them to go this way or that. The principle is the risky, more inconvenient is the one you should probably take. I know that sounds crazy. Take about it from a, from a sports point of view. I mean, what's the average batting average? Just, I mean, no one bats 100%. I mean, it's great to bat... 200 and something, or maybe 300 the most, but never, I mean, that's a third of the time, two-thirds of the time you're striking out, and a third of the time you may hit a hit. And that's even really good. Michael Jordan said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots. 300 games I've lost. 26 times missed game-winning shots. I have failed over and over again, which is why... I succeed. It reminds me of the story I just saw recently of William Shatner. Um, you know, Captain Kirk from Star Trek. Do you know that came out in the 1960s? And it ran for three years, Star Trek did, and then they closed it. Three years, and then they cut it. William Shatner tried to get some other roles, didn't get any, ended up selling his house. He ended up getting divorced. He had three kids and lived in his trailer and stuff there as he went around to different, um, basically doing different um, shots and stuff there and in and, and, um, different places and stuff there. And he tried doing a career in acting and ended up just doing small little things until finally 
10 years later, 10 years later, Trekkies wanted to see Star Trek come back because Star Wars had just come out and some others um, had just come out. And, and so Star Trek made a comeback and he got that role again of Captain Kirk and the rest was history. It went well. He ended up having a motion picture and then six motion pictures and then all the series and everything else and other roles in Hollywood. But for a long time, it looked like he was a failure. And so that risk and stuff was there. But he kept walking through that. And so that's what I would say to us when the risk of failure is don't give up. If you have that purpose and you have that calling, walk through that. You're going to fail. Everyone does. Everyone does. I've done. Everyone does. But just keep walking through that. And you never know what God may have in mind. The second chapter was chapter 10. And that's the failure, excuse me, the the fear of um, this, this fear of not pleasing somebody. I'm desperate to please somebody. So I remember it well. Um, for Lady to Lodge Family Camp, we did a lot of surveys after each one. God, that's hard to do a survey. Maybe you've done it. Um, and you hear people's comments and you go, really? Well, that, and some of the things would be like, well, we tried to do that right. And it's hard to hear that. Uh, it's hard to hear when you are a people pleaser. I grew up being a people pleaser for my mom and it's difficult when you try to live that out. And so there's this fear of not pleasing everyone, but you can't do that. I remember very distinctly one time and stuff after a big camp that we had for our fellow staff was about to open the new camp. And it was hard to hear your peers criticize you. Oh, that was so difficult. And yet, even though I was upset by that, I had to come to a place that it wasn't about pleasing everybody, that I could learn from that and grow from that. It's true for preaching too. You know, he, Adam Hamilton mentions it and stuff there that, you know, people tell you stuff sometimes. You're like, that was the worst sermon ever. Or why would you even, why would, I would never come and listen to that. I'm serious. I've heard all the different variety. Now, 90 something percent is always really good. And there's those parts. But instead of being hurt by it, how do we learn from that? How do we know that, that we can't please everybody? I mean, think about it. Jesus didn't please everybody, which is why he went to the cross. What was the center of his life wasn't pleasing people, but following his father. That's the key. It's not about pleasing others. It's about following and pleasing the God who knows you and desires the best for you to follow that. That's the one you want to please. That's the one you want to follow and live into because his grace and his forgiveness is so great. And that's ultimately what frees us from that fear of pleasing. And that's the grace and the forgiveness of God, that God is with you and God loves you. And no matter what, from that grace, that knowing that you are loved, then you can go forward. And sometimes, a lot of times you're going to please people, but sometimes you're not because that's not what God desires. Sometimes he wants me to ruffle feathers and cause problems so that people will turn and come to him. And so I'd say to you, if you have that fear of pleasing, of not pleasing everybody, to allow yourself to know that the God of all creation is pleased with you and loves you and gave you a son to forgive you and walk with you. And that is who you follow. When you do that, do the best you can. Sometimes you can do it right. Sometimes you're not. But God is pleased with you and loves you. So that leads us to that third, that next chapter and stuff there on um on chapter 11, called The Fear of Meaningless, that, that your life is meaningless, that we're, I think we're afraid inside it, that life that we, that we live will have no meaning at all. A lot of young people are afraid of that right now. It's, it's hard because, or even as you get older and stuff, did, was my life had purpose? Did it have meaning? Um, you know, I, I lived, um, there was this girl in, couple years ago that ended up committing suicide and um, partly because she just didn't see meaning. Everyone was pressuring her to do a certain thing in a certain way. And 
she felt like that her life had no meaning and purpose, that what she was doing, and she couldn't see beyond all of the things people are doing. And, and what, what is this all about anyway? Even though she was really successful, I mean, she was got into Harvard, she was valedictorian of her school, all those, it seemed like that, but it was very shallow that what she was doing just didn't seem to have any meaning. I remember for myself, um, searching in my 20s, in my early 20s, trying to say, what, what am I called to do? And I remember being, um, struggling with, with knowing that I saw the ministry in camps and conferences and in Young Life reaching out and going wider and reaching people, but having no depth. And I saw the church that I was involved in having great depth in small groups and Bible study and doing really well in worship, but didn't reach out to anybody. And I felt called to go to seminary, partly to bridge that, to have meaning of depth and width. And I still, and you know this because I say this all the time, we need to go deeper in our faith and wider in our reach. And as we do that, I believe that we know our God better in both ways through that. And so that brings meaning and purpose no matter what I'm doing. Um, you know, in Luke 9, 25, it says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? And in Luke 9, 24, right before that, all who want to save their life will lose them. Because it says the greatest commandment to live out is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, even strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I'd say to you that every single one of us has a purpose of meaning. So love God, go deeper. To love our neighbors, to go wider. If we do that, love God, love our neighbors, and we do it in a million different ways. We do it like you can do it in your job. You can do it in your family. You can do it in your neighborhood. You can do it in the church. You can do it all different places. And if you love God and love your neighbor, if you're doing that, if you're trying to do that in myriad of different ways and all the different kind of personalities that we have and things that we do, then we have meaning and purpose. So I would say to us, is that when we do that as a church and as individuals, you will find your meaning and purpose. The way you live that out specifically, it will have meaning and purpose. It doesn't matter if you're an accountant or a musician. It doesn't matter whether you're a school teacher or your mother or father or brother or sister or son or daughter. It doesn't matter if your neighbors and stuff are here or there, what part you play in the church. If you do that, whatever you do, will have meaning and purpose because God's purpose is in that, loving God and loving her neighbor. So it leads me to 12, the fear of being alone, the fear of being unloved. See, loneliness, especially right now, this COVID-19, it's a real problem, isn't it? I mean, we're kind of set apart. We're, we either can't get out because we're in a home that won't let us out, or if we can, we can't come in contact with people because we're stuck and no one wants to talk to us because they're afraid we'll have COVID or they have COVID. So we don't have the communication. So we, this loneliness and depression can sink in. And there's this fear, especially for those who have loneliness that comes out. But I want to differentiate two things. There's one that's isolation and loneliness. And one actually is just solitude. And there's a difference between those two things. You can, my wife loves solitude. She loves being by herself. She gets rejuvenated by being alone. But she still has to have relationships. She, we need to be talking and sharing and doing a part. She needs to be with the kids and she needs to be with others. And it's a part of that, but she also finds strength in the solitude. There's a difference between that and being alone. You can be around lots of people and be alone and feel, well, that no one loves you. So what does that mean and stuff that look at? I mean, um, in Genesis 2, it says it's not good that the man is alone. That's the reason the woman was to be in relate, were meant and developed to be in relationships. But some of us have different upbringings. We have different, our backgrounds are different, right? I mean, um, Adam Hamilton talks about the idea of this attachment and this. Sometimes we have um, a very good one that's a secure attachment with one another, that we have good relationships and we're secure because 
Our parents were good and secure, and that helped us. We had good friendships that helped us be secure in that. But sometimes we grew up with some very, well, anxious attachments with people. We become anxious around people that when we're around people, even if they're there, anxious that they may hurt us or that we may be hurt by them or we may hurt them. And so we become anxious in that. And the third one is just the avoidance, the avoidance of attachment, the idea that we just will avoid anybody because we're afraid we're going to keep ourselves so protected because we were hurt so much that we avoid somebody else. But the other thing that keeps us from being in good relationships is, well, sometimes we've lost somebody, a friend, a spouse, a parent, a child, whatever it is. And then, well, we're afraid of losing again. And so we experience that and we, we, we have this loss and that loss keeps us from being in relationship with somebody else. And we feel lonely, attached, and we're afraid and feel like no one can love us because look what happened before. Also in today's technology is a problem too. In technology today, we're on um, Instagram and Facebook and other social media platforms. And sometimes we're in, right now in the Zoom meetings, we're all these things that seem good, but we lose a sense of touch. I mean, I love PJs in this way because it's, man, we are great at hugging one another. I mean, the peace lasts forever, and it does, because people are going around and hugging and touching and because that's who we are. We're, we're this family of loving others and caring for others and stuff there. And it comes out in touch when we can't do that right now. It's driving you, I know it's driving you crazy. It's driving me crazy. This lack of loss of, of touch. But think about that for the rest of society that doesn't experience it at all. That all their days, most of their days are like this, just online or and they don't have anybody else to come and hug them and touch them. You feel isolated and you feel alone and unloved. So what do we do? We don't just sit there. We have to learn to re-engage. Um, how do we do that? Well, as a church, part of it is just being engaged with others around us. I mean, church isn't meant just to come and worship on Sundays. Worship on Sunday is fantastic, but it's the response to the relationships. Relationship with God and relationship with one another. They're going deeper going wider. So we do those relationships. So we care for one another and know that we're loved and love other people. Then we worship. But if we only worship and aren't engaged in the relationships to feel alone, it can feel like there's no reason to worship. So I want to encourage us to get involved, get involved in church, in a small group. We have something going on. If, if you want to start another one, if you want to start a book club or something else, let's do it. Find places of engagement involvement with somebody else that you're only in relationship with them, especially as we move out of COVID and we can begin to gather again together. But also sometimes it's about volunteering. Maybe you've retired and you need to volunteer now and stuff there or, or help out at, you know, sometimes at schools, once we get back into schools and stuff there, but um, I've just been in a meetings with um, a community activist group and stuff. And I want to be involved because I need to be involved, not just with this church, but in the activity in the community around us and stuff there. And so how do we get involved and volunteer? Um, maybe it's a part-time job you begin to do that you can serve, not just because of the money, but because you want to be involved in something and get to know people. Sometimes you just need to serve somebody, somebody at church, somebody individually. But the key in that is re-engaging in relationships. See, we're meant to be um, in these relationships. And out of those relationships, we realize that we're not alone, that you don't have to do this. I, I know sometimes you're like, well, I'm alone and no one cares, but they do. Sometimes it just comes to us to get involved and engaged in that. You know, those friends of the paralyzed man who took him through the roof to see Jesus loved him enough, served him enough, and engaged him enough to lower him to be healed. But in that process, I believe they were healed too. You see, it's in that engagement relationship with friendships and people that we too learn that we are loved and cared for. And I want you to know this as we close this time. Is Jesus is always with you, that he loves you, that he walks with you, and you are never, ever alone. So alone isn't just always about being people. Sometimes it's just being present and knowing that the Holy Spirit is with you. 
that Jesus walks with you. And to know that the church is always here. I'm here, other people. We want to make sure that you and I walk not in loneliness, but in relationship with one another and with the God who loves you. So I'll end with that, that this God loves you and is experienced through his church, through his body, who wants to go deeper in relationship with you in the wider community and his relationship with the God who loves you. Thanks for spending this 20 minutes with me. I look forward to our engagement on, on Sunday at 11.15, and we'll talk more about that and all those different, those are my thoughts on that, and we'll look forward to hearing more of yours. We'll see you on Sunday. Take care.